Welcome back to Well, That's Interesting, the Oh, It'll Make Sense Now edition. Ooh. <laughs> I'm excited to see what uh, what piece of knowledge will make everything make sense now. <laughs> Just the, the thing I've been searching for to, to make sense of all. Yeah. What is it? Ah, uh, shit, I oversold it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Today is episode 061. So that's where it came from, the origin of some popular phrases. Oh, okay. So this won't explain um, why the universe is here, but no, I like where we're going with it. (laughs) It's it's a close second. Do you like how I was searching for like the answer? You like, you said like one sentence and I was like, why are we here? (laughs) What does it all mean? Is there a God? Are there five gods? What? It's uh, mm -hmm. (laughs) slightly less deep, just. Almost as deep, but not quite. Not quite. (laughs) I will say, I am so gay for a popular phrase. Oh, yeah. And I say, not to brag, I say popular phrases every day. Um, (laughs) And and half the time, I don't understand. Where the fuck they came from. Where the fuck they came from, or what they even mean. Yeah. Ah, well... Before we get into it, uh, I am Jill Chacha. Oh, yeah! (laughs) Uh, And I am with the uh, highly quizzical Marissa Riley. Thank you. That is me. I'm here, and I am curious. (laughs) And if this is your first time listening, welcome to the flock. Welcome. Dr. Riley here comes in cold, and uh, she learns everything in real time, just like you. It's true. I had no idea what we were going to talk about until about five seconds before we started recording, and I cheated, and I read (laughs) a quick couple of words from Jill's notes, so I still don't know what we're going to talk about, but I know something that's involved, and I'm so excited, because it's one of my favorite topics in the world. Oh my god, okay. Yeah. Uh, Well, I'm excited. Yeah. I feel like I'm coming in cold. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, I guess we should begin. We should. Right, let's do it. Okay, today we're deep diving into three old sayings, and their entomology is exactly what you'd expect from this show. Oh. A balanced cocktail of fascinating and disturbing. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a balanced cocktail between fascinating and butts. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Next episode. Okay. okay. <laughs> so. And my friends, what's more disturbing, honestly, than social media and its manipulation of you? Oh, it's so disturbing. What is (laughs) happening to my brain? That's right. From the talk to the Twitter, their success depends on convincing you each and every day that if it, whatever it may be, isn't shared on their platform, did it even happen? Oh, my God. If you're not center stage, do you even exist? You want to hear something really crazy? Yeah. Um, so I was on Instagram today a lot, just doing nothing, yeah. you know, liking dog photos, mm-hmm. liking dog videos, oh yeah, the liking, best. um, uh, dog live feeds, whatever. Milton. Milton. Milton the pug. <sighs> Love Milton Check the it pug. Out. Check it out. <laughs> Amazing pug. Um, but, and, and then I unfollowed a bunch of people. I was just, I was just... <laughs> I was just, you know, doing, <laughs> living my best Instagram life, saying goodbye so, to strangers, so liking much, dogs. So much power. <laughs> so much power, just, you know, doing what I can. And then all of a sudden I get a little notification from Instagram that says I've done too much. and what? And I cannot like anything else or, or do any more actions. What? And I was like, this is embarrassing. This is so embarrassing. Instagram, that's all Instagram wants you to do. And I did too much of it. I've never even heard of that. I'm so <laughs> embarrassed. I didn't know there was a limit to Instagram. No. They will, there is. And I went there. Like it actually told you, you know, to stop? <laughs> It said it said you were you were like making too many actions. Oh, that is. Please stop. Whoa, that's like the opposite of the Netflix thing. If it asks you if you're still there, it's at least like, it's <laughs> nice. It's like checking in on you to make sure you're still alive. But Put this some, was like <laughs> bye. <laughs> if it's a mirror under your nose, Netflix is like the mom. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, she's still breathing. Oh, well, thank God. More new girl. <laughs> I've never heard of Instagram cutting off the supply. Whoa. Well, I have. And so I had to, I had to, you know, get out of Instagram and go on to Pinterest. <laughs> I had 
had to keep scrolling. But but anyways, point wow. being, um, it's I don't know what the point is. It fries your brain no, to the point where uh, you don't understand anything. That, that's anymore. an accomplishment. I don't know. <laughs> so. Anyways, back to the podcast. Uh, so my friends, today's first phrase and word is one you may have heard. It's popular in the states here, anyway. Uh, according to Dictionary.com, limelight, or to be in the limelight, means to be at the center of public attention or notoriety. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this word was so ingrained in the public sphere, it even inspired club promoter and club creator Peter Ga... What's his name? I believe it's Gation. Peter Gation. Uh, to transform an empty Gothic church on the corner of 6th Avenue and 20th Street in Manhattan into the infamous... Club Kid Mecca of the 1990s, a little place simply called the Limelight. Oh, I, okay, so I am such a nerd for anything involving the Club Kids. It's yeah. such a fun internet hole to go down. Highly recommend. Don't get on Instagram to the point of being kicked <laughs> off. Spend time Googling the Club Kids. It's fucking fascinating. Yeah. Uh, there could be an entire podcast series on this place. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So we can't possibly do it justice in a small section of one episode here. So please go check out the newly released book by legendary photographer Steve Eichner called In the Limelight, The Visual Excess of NYC Nightlife in the 90s. Amazing. Just flip, flip through it for a few minutes and you'll get a sense of first, when Manhattan used to be cool. And second... <laughs> And second, what it felt like to be at the proverbial center of the universe. Let's just say in the champagne, oh, sorry, shampoo room. Oh, even better. There was a shampoo room, uh, an above ground pool filled with thick foam. You could like jump in with your friends and just flop around while Fishbone, House of Pain, Madonna, TLC, Joe Strummer, Boy George, Tupac, Nina Cherry, or RuPaul would be performing for you, backlit by stained glass windows depicting Bible scenes. I have never wanted a time <laughs> machine more in my life. I, you know, sometimes I think I've had fun in my life. I haven't. <laughs> I have never had that kind of fun. And I've had some fun. Yeah. Let me tell you. But that sounds like more fun. We need. A, we all need a shampoo room. I want. A, <laughs> and I'm 30, and and I'm technically past that. But you know what? I'm not. I'm not above a shampoo room. I even pronounced it fan. A shampoo room. room. I would love a shampoo room. What accent is that, Jill? What is that? Don't listen to me anymore. You're doing great. Don't worry. So, uh, Dr. Marissa, would you like to see one of Steve Eichner's photos? Mm. Um, It's kids just having the fucking goddamn time of their lives in the champagne room Nothing. or the shampoo room the <laughs> shampoo, shampoo room i don't know <laughs> depends on how you want to say it let's take a look at this photo okay. <laughs> right. oh yeah. my god I know. <laughs> you guys i i mean we can only wish basically imagine like if you were looking at a bubble bath and you were you were looking so closely at a bubble bath, you couldn't see any the rest of the bathroom around you. Now imagine three kids. By kids, I mean like eighteen year old people. Yeah. In full coats, clothes, uh, dancing in these suds in these bubble bath uh, suds, and and they're just so high on ecstasy. That's what they <laughs> took back then. In case in case you don't know, Google it. Um, and yeah, so they're clearly having the time of their lives. Yeah. And yeah. It's pretty great. Yeah, it was some crazy shit. And that club really encapsulated where the word limelight came from. And if you're guessing its entomology includes open gas lines and open flame, you're absolutely right. What? <laughs> yes. So let's head on back a century to when cocaine was medicine. Yeah. The 1820s. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so this may or may not explain why Sir Goldsworthy Gurney, mm -hmm. an English surgeon, mm -hmm. chemist, mm -hmm. architect, builder, lecturer, and consultant, was experimenting with hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, that's too many slashes. No one can be all of those things. Um, and second of all... Cocaine. Cocaine. <laughs> I'm stressed. I'm stressed for whatever... Uh, this person is about to do next. So 
Anyway, he discovered that, he discovered that if you funneled a mix of two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen through a pipe, and at the end of the pipe was an open flame, boy howdy, you've made yourself a controlled fire burning at such a high temperature you could use it to weld. Whoa, okay. Yeah, that's right. We've got our first portable blowtorch of sorts, basically. Good, good times. Yeah. I'm also still worried. Yes. <laughs> More so, worried, actually. Now, this was created during the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So manufacturers, manufacturers and engineers were fucking ecstatic about this thing. Amazing. It was okay. kind of like going from a flip phone to an iPhone. Okay. A, a physically dangerous iPhone, but you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. In spirit of the revolution, inventors wanted to apply this new technology to as many parts of daily life as possible. So, when in 1825, Scottish engineer Thomas Drummond was blindly walking through the cloudy, gray Irish countryside, he knew he had to do something. Oh, God. Surveying the land was impossible. He needed light. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> Dr. Marissa, according to todayifoundout.com and Wikipedia, what is it that Thomas did that changed not only engineering, but eventually the arts? I, I would love to tell you. All yeah. right, quote. <laughs> that year, Thomas attended a demonstration held by English scientist Michael Faraday, where a cylinder of calcium oxide or lime was propped up in front of the open flame of Gurney's invention. The heat around the lime produced a brilliant white light. A year later, in 1826, Thomas had successfully built and rolled out his version of what would become a limelight burner used by engineers outdoors. The light produced from one burner was so bright it could be seen nearly 70 miles away. Holy shit, end quote. Yeah, that's right. um, I had no idea this existed. Yeah. I've never heard of it other than the popular phrase. Yeah, it was an actual fucking light. Wow. Now, before we get into how this changed the art world, Dr. Marissa, would you like to see a diagram of Drummond's invention? Oh, of course, because that description sort of helped. Yeah. But I'm like, what the what, what the, fuck? the fuck? What the fuck is this thing? So it's not a light bulb. <laughs> like, what the fuck is it? Yeah, this is before light bulbs. Uh, everything we talk about, photos, diagrams, will be on our social media stuff. So please come on by, take a look, and Absolutely. ogle the open flames. Um, <laughs> so this is a simple diagram of what it was. What do you see here? Okay. All right. So yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm. On the left side, I see what looks like a cylinder of calcium oxide, which is the lime. The lime. Correct. Okay. So right next to it is um, is the little burner, is the little flame. Yep. And then uh, it's, and it's got, in the picture, it's got a little flame that's basically touching the lime. And then from that, there are uh, two pipes. One is blue, one is red, and they are going... Um, a distance away to the right and one is attached to hydrogen one is attached to oxygen mm -hmm. and then there's a pipe that is kind of attached to um the lime mm -hmm. and um it is also going to the right um and it's a uh, attached to a screw for rotating and raising the calcium oxide so basically one thing turns the lime, yeah, and the other thing has a flame that's attached to hydrogen and oxygen. Yes, <sighs> right. exactly. Did I explain it? You was like, <laughs> it's like you fucking work this shit. There. Oh my god, I need a nap. <laughs> it's like you fucking. You're like from the 1820s, just snorting coke in your own shampoo room. <laughs> Fantastic. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you can manually, uh, there's two little levers. You can manually um, adjust the hydrogen and the oxygen as oh, well. Oh, yeah, they're and, levers. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. So this seemingly simple device was like going from an iPhone 4 to an iPhone 10 at oh, the boy. time. Now, here's what I mean. Before the limelight, theaters, for example, and outdoor entertainment 
was limited to candles, oil, and gas burners. That's a nightmare. Yeah. Those light sources were so dim, you needed a lot of fuel and a lot of fire to make a production happen. Uh, needless to say, there's been more than a handful of theater fires over the years. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. So here's where some positives... Uh, so, sorry. So, here were some positives that convinced the art world to use the good old limelight instead. Mm. One, you can cut down on the number of oil and gas burners you have. Amazing. Which could cut down on the chances of your theater burning down. Always a plus. <laughs> and two, your production value would go through the roof. Because all of those manual knobs means you can recreate a sunrise, a sunset, moonlight... With, yeah, with a few strategically placed limelight burners, you could control what people saw. My friends, you can focus the entire theater's attention to a single point. And you guessed it, sometimes it was center stage, the proverbial center of the universe. It all comes together. There you go. And the first theater to see the possibilities and use this cutting-edge technology indoors was no other than the Royal Opera House in London in 1837. Oh, la la. Yeah, and that's all it took for the rest of the world to follow suit. Amazing. By the 1860s, limelights were used in theaters worldwide and for like a good 40 years. Limelights totally burned bright until, you guessed it, electricity. Ah. Uh. Love I know. electricity. <laughs> I know. So problematic, so comfortable. <laughs> Unlike with electric lights, those limelight burners had to be monitored the entire time they were in use. Yeah. I mean, an open flame is still an open flame. Yeah. And open hydrogen and open oxygen lines are still like open oxygen <laughs> hydrogen lines. I'm glad you addressed those yeah. because I'm like, this is a recipe for a uh, disaster. Yeah, it could be. So Dr. Marissa, please tell us, according to Britannica.com, the cons of the limelight uh, that eventually made it lose out to electricity. Oh, of course. All right. Quote, the greatest disadvantage of limelight was that each light required the almost constant attention of an individual operator who had to keep adjusting the block of calcium oxide as it burned and to tend the two cylinders of gas that fueled it. End quote. That sounds terrible. Yeah. I hate monitoring stuff. I hate working. I hate doing anything. How dare anyone make me do anything except you, for this podcast? Yeah. This Can you imagine easy. just having to constantly look at something I hate for that. hours? <laughs> That's not a TV show that I'm binging. Even yeah. that, I'm like, I have to get on Instagram now. Yeah. I, we need to talk about that later. So <laughs> my Instagram addiction. Yeah. Yes. So embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, my friends, compared to electricity, which can be controlled with the flick of a switch, this stuff was complicated and costly. So with that, the short life of limelights had come to an end. Aww. But, there's always a but, their impact was so damn transformative, the word itself never left popular culture. Aww. The first time the word was seen in print, not used to signify lighting, but the focus of attention was in a New York Times article in 1902. Oh. My friends, some things don't change because the first time it was used in print, get this, it was used to highlight a disgraced, corrupt cop. Holy shit. Yes. Oh my God. I yeah. love it. That's so funny. <laughs> I know. Dr. Marissa, please read a brief excerpt from that old-timey news article. Oh my God. Okay, quote... William S. Devery was in the limelight last evening. Tens of thousands of people uh, of the district crowded the streets in the neighborhood and shouted the name of the ex-chief of the of police of New York. End quote. Yes. So just going to say what's going on here. Long story short. This um, officer uh -huh. was charged with bribery and extortion in 1897. Got it. Was investigated by a committee set up by Teddy Roosevelt himself in 1899. Oh, my God. And was still in a position of authority until finally booted from office in 1902 and was met by that unruly mob. Good don't, times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, but don't worry. 
He died rich because that's the world we live in. I'm so sorry. sorry. Damn it. I was like, justice for New York. Nope. No. Yeah, he made a shit ton of money. It, he like he was involved in like the New York Yankees. It was gr- it's gross. Look him up if you want to. But mm, anyway, so little has changed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the history of Limelight. I love it. And after the break, our fun continues. You don't want to miss our entomology extravaganza. Ooh. <laughs> Stay tuned, please do. When Johann Rahl received the letter on Christmas Day, seventeen seventy six, he put it away to read later. Maybe he thought it was a season's greeting and wanted to save it for the fireside. But what it actually was, was a warning, delivered to the Hessian colonel, letting him know that General George Washington was crossing the Delaware and would soon attack his forces. The next day, when Rawl lost the Battle of Trenton and died from two Colonial Boxing Day musket balls, the letter was found, unopened in his vest pocket. As someone with 15,000 unread emails in his inbox, I feel like there's a lesson there. Oh well, this is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the bad ideas, mistakes, and accidents that misshaped our world. Find us at constantpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Have you ever wondered what really happened to Amelia Earhart or the lost colony of Roanoke? Do you ever find yourself scouring the internet for vicious Victorians and their murders by gaslight? Or perhaps you're just sick and tired of women being constantly misrepresented or plain lied about throughout history? If so, join me, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books on Who Did What Now? The history podcast that's not your history class part of the Area of Media Network. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Adios, au revoir, au revoir to zen, my friends. Bye-bye. I'll be seeing you. Hey, everyone. Jill Chacha here from Well That's Interesting, and I am absolutely thrilled to tell you about Spotify for Podcasters. I use it, I love it, and it all started by downloading the free Spotify for Podcasters app, which has all the tools you need in one place to record and edit your masterpiece of a podcast. Spotify for Podcasters also distributes your show to all major platforms. So when you hit publish, your episodes will stream not only on Spotify, but I'm talking about the Apples, the Googles, Stitcher, Good Pods, the other ones. <laughs> You get the idea. And you can monetize your podcast with no minimum listenership required. You could also set up monthly subscriptions and record ads just like this one. So what are you waiting for? Download Spotify for Podcasters today and start changing the world. Oh, and please, stay interesting. And we're back. We are so back. We're so back. And we're watching 30-year-old Henry Gribbum Jr., lose his life savings. Sounds about right. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, my friends, we're in beautiful New England, uh, the northeast section of the United States. And it's a beautiful spring day back in ye olde 2013. Oh. Now. So long ago. So long ago. Might as well be 1820. Pretty much. (laughs) Oh, my God. Christ. Now, with spring comes flowers, baby chicks, and you guessed it, Rigged carnival games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Duh. Now, I don't know much about Henry, but this one incident in his life is very telling. Uh, he joined his fellow New Englanders uh, in the festivities by trying his luck at a ball toss game called Tubs of Fun. <laughs> so. I I, I want to think of some sort of joke, potentially dirty, yeah. Uh, with the phrase tubs of fun, but I, I can't right now. So I will get back to you on that in like the next 10 minutes. Okay. It's boobs. I figured it out. It's okay. boobs. It's, it's boobs. <laughs> How'd I do? It's so good. It's, it's, it's tubs of fun. You're right. Tubs of fun. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so now, um, <laughs> I forgot I wrote this in my notes, but I wrote, now I gave this a Google. <laughs> Tubs of fun. 
<clears throat> it wasn't boobs. Um, it was actually more like what it literally sounds like. Uh, there's several plastic buckets or tubs lined up, and the player, standing several feet away, uh, is challenged to toss a ball into said bucket. Okay. 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 Now, if you miss the bucket or if the ball bounces out, you have to shell out more dough for another chance. Oh. Um, if the planets align just right and the ball goes in and stays in, you win a prize. Like jumbo sunglasses or a plush poop emoji. Or... Which is weirdly so vital <laughs> when you're playing one of these games. You're like, I will die yeah. if I don't get that plush bear. Yeah. I will die. Yeah. I will die. <laughs> That's right. Those, those intense emotions are right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to it. Yeah. Now, I don't know if Henry is hyper competitive or has anger issues or doesn't know that carnival games are rigged because over an untold number of tosses, Henry lost $300. Henry, you have to quit at, at like yeah. 15. I know. I know. And, and even that's like embarrassing. Yeah. And for some godforsaken reason, according to the MarySue.com article, Man Loses Life Savings on Carnival Game, hmm. he went home, grabbed 2300 more dollars. Wait. And headed right back to the same carnival booth. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh-huh. No. Yeah. No. Without a dime to his name, Henry finally caught on and complained to the carnival's manager, whereupon he was refunded $600 and given, well, Dr. Marissa, would you do the honors and tell us what Henry walked away with? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, quote, an anthropomorphic stuffed banana with dreadlocks. End quote. Yeah. This sounds like the carnival version of the guy from White Lotus who didn't get the pineapple sweet. Oh my god. Yes. Until he complained enough and got the pineapple sweet. Yeah. For but, like one night. Yeah. And his girlfriend left him. Like yes. it was just like <laughs> And a lot of worse shit happened too. And worse I mean, yeah, yeah. someone died. But like oh yeah. <laughs> I won't say who. Um yeah. Whoops. Yeah. He got a uh, plush banana with dreadlocks. So now, wow! if you're wondering how the game was rigged, you might think, well, maybe the balls were slightly oversized or some shit. But yeah. my friends, the grift is even more subtle. What? Dr. Marissa, please tell us, according to Bill L. Howard, author of Carnival Fraud 101. Amazing title. I know, very, <laughs> we very, have to read this tomorrow. <laughs> very straightforward. Uh, how is this game not really a game at all? Oh my God. Please tell us. I, I am so f already so fascinated. I'm so excited to finally learn. Okay. Quote, from the inside of the booth, the carny tosses a soft ball from his vantage point. It stays inside the tub. Then he gives you the second soft ball for a practice throw. And it stays in for a win. Why? The carney's first ball remains inside the tub to deaden the impact and prevent you and prevent your loss from bouncing out. Your toss. Your toss. <laughs> mm. You got it. The carney's first ball remains in the tub to deaden the impact and prevent your toss from bouncing out. Okay. But once you hand over your money, he removes both balls and hands them to you. Without a deadening ball, guess what? Your first toss bounces out. You might as well throw your second ball away because no way it will stay inside the tub. And quote, thank you for bearing with me through that explanation. I wanted it to be so crystal clear for me at least <laughs> because as a kid, I played the shit. Yeah. It, it, and it never happens. Yeah, it you bounces never right win. Out. That's right. It bounces right the that fuck is out. Genius. Yeah, that is genius. Yeah, but a player can't keep losing, right? Otherwise, no one else will play the game. Yeah. So I'm sure Henry was allowed to win every so often to keep him interested, to hype up the game, making wins feel bigger than they actually are, and the losses feel more heartbreaking. It's really an art, yeah. if you think about it, knowing when to keep them losing and when to throw in some motivation. A phrase like, close but no cigar. Oh. Yeah, yeah, this is an old one, but that's right, my friends. This very American phrase was born out of a very American pastime. 
grifting people at carnival games. I love it. Yeah. It's one of my favorite <laughs> American pastimes. So, Amazing. Now, if you're not too familiar with it, good old Wiktionary defines it thusly. Close but no cigar is used to indicate that one is almost correct or has almost succeeded, but not quite. Yes, I have heard it. Yeah. Back in the late 19th and 20th century, carnies would belt this phrase out to unknowing participants, all in hopes to keep them playing. Oh. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why the fuck a cigar? Yes, I am thinking yeah. that. That's a great question. Well, the answer is kind of simple. They didn't have plush bananas with dreadlocks back then. What a shame. <laughs> so, <laughs> so get this, to one and all, young and old, they handed out cigars. What? And because carnivals traveled, the phrase spread far and wide and quickly made its way into the American vernacular, showing up in print as early as 1929. <gasps> Interesting. Yeah. I can't believe they gave cigars away to kids. <laughs> Why would the kids even want to play? To kids to get the cigars. Did kids like cigars? <laughs> yes. Did kids smoke cigars? It's in the twenties. Come on, they had to. They did. That was, that was probably medicine. But like, like but that was like, I'm talking about like a five year old kid. Did a five year old kid smoke a cigar? I mean, chill. <laughs> I'm having a moment. You having a moment. I'm having a moment. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, let's continue with the podcast. (laughs) I mean, I'm I'm assuming going to the doctor was really just going to the carnival. Going to the carny. (laughs) For cigars? To kids even, I don't even like cigars. I think they're gross. And I'm like, you know, someone who likes uh, substances. Like, I'm, (laughs) I like a good time. But, like, cigars? Cigars, man. They're gross. Yeah. Not to a five-year-old. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, sorry. So according to todayifoundout.com, uh, it was the year, uh, 1929 was the year an article in the Long Island Press used the entire phrase as a headline to sum up the shortcomings of Hugo Straub, who finished second in not one, but two presidential races. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch, Hugo. Yeah. Uh, hopefully he didn't lose his life savings also. He but did, definitely. <laughs> probably. 100%. Two presidential races, probably. Oh, yeah. You're broke after that. So, okay. Now, we've covered two very American phrases. Oh, yes. So I thought for our last one, you know, you know, I'm absolutely certain everyone listening has used it, has said it, and dreads it. My friends, it's one word, okay? Okay. And it's a hefty one. Deadline. Oh. (laughs) I have a a love-hate relationship with deadline. Yeah. On the one hand, I hate it. Yeah. (laughs) But on the other hand, um, I hate it as well. Yeah. But I will get something done. So motivational. (laughs) There's hate and then there's hate with... um, Mm. What's yeah. the progress? I don't know. Hate with progress. That's that actually makes a lot of sense, and we'll get to it. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. okay. So if this strikes fear into your heart and makes you feel super uncomfortable, yes, there's a pretty damn good reason why. Uh, it's got one bloody history, and its roots are planted in 19th century warfare. Of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. The word was coined sometime between 1861 and 1865 during, you guessed it, the American Civil War. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. And at the time, the word was quite, quite literal. Um, There was a line, and if you crossed it, you'd be shot. It's so literal. Yeah. So, Dr. Marissa, please tell us how it came to be about, and in what context was it initially used? Uh, There you go. I will tell you. Okay. (laughs) From todayifoundout.com, quote, according to author Christine Amer, deadline was coined at the hellish Andersonville, Georgia prison camp. Oh, my God. (laughs) And first appeared in writing in the report of Confederate Inspector General Colonel D.T. Chandler, Uh, On July 5th, 1864, 
in describing the horrific conditions, he famously wrote, the federal prisoners of war are confined within a stockade 15 feet high of roughly hewn pine logs about 8 inches in diameter inserted 5 feet into the ground enclosing an area of 540 to 260 yards. A railing around the inside of the stockade and about 20 feet from it constitutes the deadline beyond which the prisoners are not allowed to pass day or night under penalty of being shot. As a large portion of the stockade is at present unfit for occupation, this gives somewhat less than six square feet to each prisoner. End quote. That quote makes me want to cross yeah. the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's its own squid game, basically. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but with less, um, just uh, piz- like pizzazz, yes. like um, <laughs> that's right, uh, art direction, yeah, and plot, yeah, exactly. Yes. So this is a terrible, terrible fucking bummer. Uh, but good news, this military term and technique quickly spread, being used in prisons across the land. Great. <laughs> so, <laughs> it should be no surprise then. By the early 1900s this infamous word reached the general public. Oh, no. uh, there, its meaning changed just a smidge. Just a smidge. From a literal line that shouldn't be crossed to a figurative one. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the earliest examples of this use in print uh, could be found in the short story called The Enchanted Profile. Oh. It was written in 1909. And boy, howdy, it sure sounds like it. Oh, my God. Um, the word shows up in a description of a female character named Miss Ida, Miss Ida Bates. Ida man. Bates. Miss Ida Bates. Uh, brace yourself. I'm going to read it, okay? Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> so, I'm braced. Okay. It states thusly, <clears throat> the stenographer and typewriter of the Acropolis Hotel was Miss Ida Bates. She was a holdover from the Greek classics. There wasn't a flaw in her looks. <laughs> Some old timer, in paying his respects to a lady, said to have loved her was a liberal education. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, even to have looked over the black hair and neat white, sh- white shirt waist of Miss Bates was equal to a full course in any correspondence school in the country. What? I know. She sometimes did a little typewriting for me, and as she refused to take the money in advance, she came to look upon me as something of a friend and protege. <laughs> she had unflailingly kindness and good nature and not even the not even a white lead drummer or a fur importer had ever dared to cross the deadline of good behavior in her presence so there's so much going on there so and much. i i feel like we need a whole other podcast just to talk about old timey misogyny <laughs> yeah. She, she, that's basically him. Yeah. Wow. This is like the Louis C.K. apology. It's like, (laughs) I'm sorry they admired me. They just admired me. I got it for free. She admired me with her shirt. Uh, (laughs) She did work for me. So kind. (laughs) So kind with her black hair. I don't know. (laughs) So, yeah. So funny. So, yeah. And... Blah, blah, blah. So (laughs) it's just a smattering of misogyny. So uh, anyway, by the time the roaring, modern, booming, flapping, chain-smoking 1920s rolled around, the term changed once more into what we know today, Yeah, which is kind of like a merging of the two previous ideas. Agreed. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Marissa, the book, uh, America in So Many Words by Alan Metcalf and David K. Barnhart, I think explained it best. So please tell us what initiated the shift and how it combines the terror of death and the terror of consequences. Oh my God. Please tell us. I would love to. I would (laughs) love to. All right. Quote, it was never the newspaper business. It was. Oh, (laughs) this is how like traumatized I am by this word. This is not part of the quote. This is just my reaction. (laughs) And her hand is... Uh, in her face. So embarrassed. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, let's do this again. Okay. Quote, it was the newspaper business that made Deadline more than just a historical curiosity. 
to have the latest news and to still get a newspaper printed and distributed on time requires strict time limits for those who write it. Yet, many are the excuses for writers who go beyond their allotted time. Writer's block, perfectionism, or just plain procrastination. Been there. Yeah. Seeking the strongest possible language to counter these temptations, editors set deadlines with the implication that your story is dead. You are dead if you go beyond this time to finish it. Whew. Yeah. Our urgent 20th century has made such deadlines essential, not just for reporters and other writers, but in every kind of activity. There are deadlines for finishing a job or assignment, for entering a contest, for ransoming hostages, <laughs> or buying a product at the special sale price. End quote. I like how ransoming hostages <laughs> they, was thrown into this woo, like list yeah. of mundane daily activities. Some good writing, right? Good. There. <laughs> uh, they were on a deadline. <laughs> yes, my friends, a word taken from the battlefield and prisons and applied to our capitalist 24-7 content media-driven world is pretty spot on. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Pretty spot on. So what can I say? But please, rate, subscribe, tell your friends about, well, that's interesting. Do it. <laughs> and where Deadline, Limelight, and the cigar thing came from. <laughs> From kids smoking cigars. Yeah, that's right. Can you believe it? I still can't. <laughs> oh, uh, but please, please stay interesting. Please do.